Good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you to our training on special education, Frequently Asked Questions 2.0. This training will cover some of the most commonly asked questions parents ask about IEPs and discipline. As part of our fact series, we plan to offer special education facts 1.0 that covers the identification, referral, and evaluation part of special education, and special education fact 3.0 that covers the transition process. To ensure this training is helpful and relevant to you, we'll be doing some interactive activities and we'll ask you to complete an evaluation at the end. The evaluation results help us continuously improve training. It should take you less than two minutes to complete the evaluation. Everyone completing an evaluation will receive a copy of the PowerPoint and a certificate of attendance. If at any time you lose audio or video, you may call in using the phone number included in your registration confirmation. Y'all are encouraged to submit questions in the chat box. We'll also have question and answer time at the end of the training if you prefer to wait until then. I'm Melinda Elliott and I'm the presenter for the training Frequently Asked Questions 2.0. Families Helping Families of Southwest Louisiana is one of 10 nonprofit family resource centers in the Families Helping Families Network of Centers. We're here to provide support to parents of children, youth and adults with disabilities, or special health care needs, um, and professionals. We do, the, do, we do this through individual assistance, information sharing, outreach, and trainings. This training was created with funding from the United States Department of Education to the Louisiana Parent Training and Information Center. That's a program of Families Helping Families of Greater New Orleans. It's done in collaboration with the Louisiana Department of Education to be used by the statewide network of Families Helping Families Centers. Families Helping Families of Southwest Louisiana provides webinars and eventually, again, will provide in-person trainings on special education and disability related topics. We invite you to check out our website and our Facebook page for our events at www.fhfswla.org. That's our website regularly. And you can register for any upcoming training that might be of interest to you. We invite you to make requests of specific trainings that currently aren't being offered. Chances are if you're interested in a topic, someone else is too. <clears throat> I'm also the Lacan leader in this area. Um, I cover Beauregard, Allen, Calcasieu, Jeff Davis, and Cameron Parishes, just like the Families Helping Family Center of Southwest Louisiana does. Um, Lacan's a statewide grassroots advocacy network, which links policy makers, individuals with disabilities, and family members to make positive change in systems serving people with developmental disabilities. Lacan also advocates for policies and systems that support inclusion everywhere people learn, work, live, play, it advocates for systems that support children and adults with disability to live in their own home and to be fully included and participating members of their local schools and communities. Lacan leaders like myself provide connection with a regional team of advocates. They provide information on proposed policy changes and how those changes affect you and others. Um, Lacan leaders also provide training and skills to ab effectively advocate for systems change and support you with link you to policymakers. Right now in the legislative session um, that's currently going on, we are working on 
a $2 per hour rate increase for providers with an $8.65 beginning rate for the DSWs. Those are the direct support workers. If you have a child with a developmental disability and have a waiver or are on, or on the waiver waiting list, you have access to that type of service. We're also working on a increased funding for the Families Helping Family Centers. Um, and then we have a senator that has offered a bill for cameras in the special education classroom for students that um, typically aren't verbal or aren't very verbal. So parents have peace of mind about their child. If you're interested in any of those issues and you go to the www Lacan Advocates, that's all one word with an S on the end, .org, you can sign up. You're basically signing up to get the emails. Of course, the emails talk about the issues and about contacting your legislators, different ones at different times. And we hope you'll take the action. Some people will even be interested in telling their so stories. I have lots of opportunities for parents to talk about how things work for them or what things would help um, people with disabilities. So please go sign up. So we're going to start with a quick icebreaker. I want to check my mic to make sure y'all can hear me. The icebreaker question is, where would you like to travel? So I want you to type your answer in the chat box. I like it when I see people interacting and asking questions in the chat box. It makes the presentation more interesting. Um, so I'd like to go to Rhode Island. Um, I've been various places in the United States, um, but I think Rhode Island or maybe the Grand Canyon. Um, have any of y'all been there? So um, let me check the chat box. Oh, so somebody wants to go to Colorado to visit their sister. Cool. I have been to Colorado, have y'all? My sister was actually born in Colorado. Somebody said that they had passed through Colorado. Colorado is a pretty place, it's colorful. Okay. Well, we'll just go ahead and go on and like I said y'all can type things into the chat box as you need to or as you want to. So we want to make sure this training is useful to families and one of the ways we do that is with a check-in process. I'm going to launch a check-in poll. Actually Wallace is helping me today. Wallace is going to launch the check-in poll. I forgot to tell y'all. Um, the, uh, and thank Wallace for helping me today. Um, the check-in poll has a series of eight true or false questions. All you need to do to answer these questions is use your keyboard and, or mouse to answer. I actually won't know how each of you answer individually. I'll know collectively as, as a group how you answered. So let's get started. True or false, IEP meetings are limited to 60 minutes at a time. If more time is needed, the meeting can be reconvened. And remember, you have to scroll down to be able to see all the questions. Two, true or false, parents do not have to attend IEP meetings. Three, true or false, I have to pick up my child every time the school calls and tells me to pick 
him or her up from the school. Don't forget to scroll down. Four, true or false, students with an IEP cannot be suspended. Five, true or false, school districts cannot charge any fees for a child with an IEP. Six, true or false, a school district must offer an IEP that is reasonably calculated to enable a child to make progress. Seven, true or false, a school does not need parental permission to make minor adjustments to the IEP. Eight, true or false, the Louisiana IEP guide is referred to as Louisiana Bulletin 1706. So I'm gonna give everybody a few more minutes to finish the poll. If anybody needs any more time, you can let me know in the chat box. We're just going to do a few more seconds. Okay, great. Thank you for um, doing the poll. So the learning objectives for this training are to provide you a list with commonly used acronyms and terms, to answer frequently asked questions about IEPs, to answer frequently asked questions about behavior and discipline, to answer frequently asked questions about COVID-19, and finally, to provide you with some resources on where to find answers to these frequently asked questions and more. Let's start with the most commonly used acronyms in this presentation. Some of the commonly used acronyms you'll hear throughout the presentation is IEP, Individualized Education Program, FAPE, Free Appropriate Public Education, IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, LRE, Least Restrictive Environment, PBIS, Positive Behavior Intervention Supports, FBA, Functional Behavior Assessment, BIP, Behavior Intervention Plan, MDR, Manifestation Determination Review, OCR, Office of Civil Rights. Then some additional terms you'll hear me reference are Bessie, 
That's the Louisiana Board of Elementary and Secondary Education, which is our state school board. Bulletin 1706, the Louisiana Regulations of the Children with Exceptionalities Act. This is Louisiana's Regulations for the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. We also have Bulletin 1530, Louisiana's IEP Handbook, Strong Start 2020, Louisiana's Department of Education COVID-19 guidance documents, and then finally, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. This is the federal law that prohibits discrimination based on disabilities. So let's get started. My first fact is how do I prepare for my annual IEP meeting? Preparing for your child's individual education program or IEP meeting isn't tough, but it takes a little time. This will be time well spent if you go into the meeting organized. If your child has been receiving any outside for help for school as a, like a tutor or therapist, ask them for their input. You could also talk to your child's teacher about what seems to be working or not working and any thoughts he or she might have. Of course, if your child can communicate, find out their feelings about school. That can give you valuable information. Review your child's current IEP goals. Review their progress reports and see how close they are to meeting these goals. If you're not sure, ask the teacher those questions before the meeting. Your child should be making great strides in meeting the goals or coming close to meeting them. If they're not, you should be very concerned and question why the IEP team hasn't reconvinced sooner. IEP team meetings must be held once a year, but you can have an IEP meeting more frequently if you need it. A good reason to hold one more frequently is when a child isn't making progress towards their goals. Reread your most recent evaluation. Every time you read it, you're going to get something new from it or something new will pop out at you. If it's your first IEP meeting, make sure you receive your evaluation in advance of your I, first IEP meeting, a draft evaluation, and have enough time to read and understand it. If you had your IEP determine, uh, your evaluation determination meeting, you should have a final copy of the evaluation so you can read it again. There's just lots of information in there. The IEP has block. The IEP itself has a block for parent concerns. Make sure you make a list of your concerns to be added to the IEP. Those are your concerns. So don't agree not to include them if this, somebody on the team says something like, oh, we're, we're addressing that. So like, if your concern is your child isn't reading on grade level and the teacher says the reading interventions, interventionist is working with him or her, so that doesn't need to be a concern, you want to include a statement like, quote, even with the support of a reading interventionist, I'm still concerned about my child not reading on grade level, unquote. Um, that's your box. You want to include your concerns. You want to go to the IEP meetings with a list to discuss. So the list should be in two columns. One is non-negotiable. So that's things that are FAPE related. Then the other list might be negotiable. Those are things that are non-FAPE related that would be nice to have, but not necessarily required by law. So the next fact question, who must be in attendance at the IEP meeting? Bulletin 1706 is the regulations for implementation 
of the Children with Exceptionalities Act. So those are Louisiana's regulations to ensure IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, are being followed. 321 of Bulletin 1706 requires the school district shall ensure that an IEP team for each student with a disability includes one or both of the parents of the student. So there might be different ways the parent can participate, um, but they're supposed to be invited. They have to be invited. Not less than one regular education teacher of the student. If the student is or may be participating in the regular education environment, and I don't know why a student wouldn't be in some regular education class. Um, the third person would be one special, uh, one, not less than one special education teacher of the student or where appropriate, not less than one special education provider of the student. So I'm thinking about children that have speech only IEPs, then you're gonna need that speech therapist as part of the IEP team. The fourth person should be what we call the ODR, the officially designated representative of the school district who's qualified to provide or supervise the provision of specially designed instruction to meet the unique needs of students with disabilities and who is knowledgeable about the general education curriculum and who is knowledgeable about the availability of resources in the school district. Five, and some of these roles might, the same person might fulfill more than one of these roles. But the fifth person is an individual who can interpret the instructional implications of evaluation results. And then at the discretion of the parent of the school district is other individuals who have knowledge or special expertise regarding the student, including related service personnel as appropriate. And then whenever appropriate, the student with a disability. If the student's transition age, that's 16 or over, the school district will invite the student with a disability to attend her, his or her IEP meeting. If the student does not attend the meeting, the school district shall take steps to ensure the student's preferences and interests are considered. Next fact is the school required to give me advance notice for an IEP meeting. Again, 322 of Bulletin 1706 requires the school district to take steps to ensure that one or both of the parents of the student with a disability are present at each IEP team meeting or afforded the opportunity to participate. This process includes notifying the parents of the meeting early enough to ensure they'll have an opportunity to attend and scheduling the meeting at a mutually agreed upon time and place. Section 322 of Bulletin 1706 also provides for other methods to ensure parent participation. If neither parent can attend an IEP meeting, the school district shall use other methods to ensure parent participation, including individual or conference telephone calls. Under 328 of Bulletin 1706, the parent or school district may agree to use alternative means of, means of meeting participation, like video conferences and conference calls. The Strong Start 2020 Family Toolbox for Students with Disabilities Guidance allows for additional flexibility in how you hold meetings. Virtual meetings or meetings before or after school might be necessary. Is there a time limit on IEP meetings? Nowhere in the regulations is it addressed 
that there's a time limit on the IEP meetings. The law doesn't provide any guidance on minimum or maximum amount of minutes to meet. But the meeting should be long enough to provide the team enough time to plan a unique and appropriate IEP for your child. If for some reason you feel rushed, you always can ask to reconvene the meeting at another time. And again, if the members of the team start the meeting stating they have a limited amount of time, let them know you're happy to far, go as far as y'all can, but we'll reconvene if it isn't done or if it's feeling like it's being rushed. An initial IEP meeting could last as long as a few hours, depending on the needs of the child. Unfortunately, some schools try to schedule a lot of IEPs on certain days and block out specific short time frames. That's just so inappropriate for an initial IEP meeting or even an annual IEP meeting. There's no way you can adequately go over the necessary IEP meet items in a predetermined minimum period. As a rule of thumb, I tell people to plan on an hour at minimum for an IEP meeting. Another fact, can I request a specific methodology for my child? So, short answer is no. But, well, no, the IEP doesn't give parents any rights around methodology schools choose to use. But if your child is not progressing with the methodology being used, the IEP team needs to reconvene and determine what, what methodology will be used next. The IEP team should always be checking, monitoring for progress. And if the child's not making adequate progress, progress they need to revisit how they're teaching the child. If you know about a specific program or curriculum, curriculum methodology that's been successful with your child and your child's not making adequate progress with the methodology being used at your school, I'd recommend having your request added to the parental concerns part of the IEP. Remember that specific box. If your child isn't making adequate progress and the school refuses to use the methodology of your choice, having it added under parental concerns will then give you a permanent record of your request. And the school will need to provide you with prior written notice stating why they refuse to do it. Both of these things are gonna be powerful evidence in the event you decide to pursue any future action. So we're gonna do a little poll. Um, this is the first one. I'm gonna launch, or Wallace is gonna launch the poll. So the question is, does the parent have to participate in the IEP meeting? Your choices are, if the parent refuses to attend the meeting, the school must assign a surrogate parent to attend. The next choice is no, the school cannot hold an IEP meeting without a parent. The third question, uh, answer, possible answer, is a meeting may be held without a parent in attendance if the school district is unable to convince the parent to attend. Gonna give everybody a few more seconds to answer the poll. And I believe if I remember correctly, we're gonna look at the answers to this one. Like I said, nobody's gonna see any one person's answer though. We just, let's see like everybody's answer. Okay, so let's end the sucker and share the results. 
Okay. So 25% of us said if the parent refuses to attend the meeting, the school must assign a surrogate parent. 25% of us said a school cannot hold an IEP meeting without a parent. And 50% of us said a meeting can be held without a parent in attendance if the school district is unable to convince the parent to attend. So let's stop sharing this and figure out what the answer is. The correct, the correct answer was C. In section 322 of Bulletin 1706, under parent participation and conducting an IEP meeting without a parent in attendance, a meeting may be conducted without a parent in attendance if the school district is unable to convince the parent they should attend. The district has to keep a record of its attempts to arrange a mutually agreed upon time and place. Those records can be detailed records of telephone calls made or attempted and the result of those calls, or copies of correspondence sent to the parents and any responses received, um, and detailed records of visits made to parents' home or employment and the results of those visits. It's important to remember that if the parent meets without the parent and it's the first IEP meeting, the parents still have to sign the IEP before services can be started. That's what happens with the initial IEP meeting. Let's look at where you can find the information on IEP meetings. This is a screenshot of the Louisiana Department of Education homepage. You can get there by going to Louisiana Believes, it's all one word with an S on the end.com, and you're going to be able to see some of these things when you get your copy of the PowerPoint. So if you see where I clicked and there's a blue arrow, it says students with disabilities. If you click on that, it's going to go here. This is the landing page on resources for students with disabilities. Then if you click on this link where my blue arrow is again, it will bring up a list of special education guidance documents for families. It goes to this page. If you scroll down the document, you're gonna to get to a section called special education bulletins. So you can see where I have a blue arrow again by bulletin 1706. You're now at the Louisiana Board of Elementary and Secondary Education Policies and Bulletins page. The actual bulletin is right here. Let's look at that a little bit. This is the table of contents on the bulletin. Then you go down to chapter D on page 30. That's the beginning of the IEP meeting process. This is the, when you click on it, this is the page 31 of Bulletin 1706. Section 322 is where parent participation starts. Bulletin 1706 is big and can be overwhelming if you ever try to sit down and read it and find a specific section. However, 
Bulletin 1706, along with most of the state bulletins are downloadable into a Microsoft Word document that allows you to use the Word navigation bar in the document to find specific words. When you type in that navigation bar, bar Word's going to give you a list of everywhere that word is used in the document. Okay, let's go back to our fact questions. Do I have to pick up my child every time he has a meltdown? When a school calls for you to pick up your child, you need to ask, are they sick? If the school says no, then you need to ask why you are picking them up. If it, they say it's because he's having a bad day, you ask, are they being suspended? If they say no, you need to tell them you won't be picking them up. They have an IEP, so they should have a behavior plan for them to follow. If they don't, then request an IEP meeting to set up a positive behavior intervention plan. And notice I said positive behavior intervention plan. If they insist you pick up your child, you can do one of two things. You can either refuse or require them to do an official suspension. Sometimes schools make it sound like they're doing you a favor by calling it just a cool off day. It's not a favor. There are very specific rules around about suspensions for students with disabilities. This is why you want all cool off days marked as suspensions. There's no limit to how many cool off days they can use. A lot of times we hear stories like the school said they'll call the police if they don't or if we don't come and pick them up. Don't panic. Let them know you consider this to be a violation of your child's rights. And rather than call the police, why don't they just suspend them and then you'll come pick them up. Sometimes we parents like us get calls from office clerks or discipline staff who are not aware that the student has an IEP. If you think that's what's going on, you want to ask them if the special education teacher is aware of the suspension and ask that them to get the special education teacher to call you. Then you give that person the same information. You give that teacher the same information. Another fact question, what is a school's responsibility for handling continuous behavior issues? So let's see. If your child's behavior prevents him or other children from learning, the IEP should include goals to address those problem behaviors. The team needs to consider positive behavior intervention supports. That's PBIS. Sometimes I see it as PBS. But remember, it's positive behavior intervention supports and other strategies to change the child's behavior. Research demonstrates that PBIS and supports are effective in dealing with behavior that's dangerous, disruptive, impedes learning, and leads to social exclusion. Students exhibiting continuous behavior issues should have a functional behavior ass assessment. That's an FBA, which identify, which will identify the purpose of the behavior. Data will be collected and analyzed by observing the child in different settings. The data should identify the behavior that needs to change. Then a hypothesis is made about the reason for the behavior and interventions are developed to help change the behavior. Those interventions then need to be tracked and evaluated for if they're being effective or not. A behavior intervention plan, a BIP, needs to be created for any child with continuous behavior problems. The plan should address skills training to increase appropriate behavior, changes in the classroom or other environments to reduce or eliminate 
problem behaviors and strategies to replace problem behaviors with appropriate behaviors and supports for your child to use the appropriate behaviors and then data collection to monitor your child's progress. Another question, can my child be suspended if he or she has an IEP? School personnel may remove a student with a disability who violates a code of student conduct for, from his or her current placement to an appropriate interim alternative educational setting or suspension for not more than 10 school days to the extent those alternatives are applied to students without disabilities. And for additional removals of not more than 10 consecutive days in that same school year for separate incidents of misconduct, as long as those removals don't constitute a change of placement. If a student with a disability has removed, been removed for his or her current placement for a total of 10 cumulative school days in the same school year, then the school district has to provide services to the extent required during any subsequent days of removal. Schools, school personnel can consider any unique circumstances on a case-by-case -case basis when determining whether a change of placement consistent with requirements related to discipline and is appropriate for a student with a disability who violates the code of conduct. For disciplinary changes in placement that would go over the 10 consecutive school days, if the behavior gave rise to the violation of the school code is determined not to be a manifestation of the student's disability, school personnel can apply the same disciplinary procedures to students with disabilities just the same way and for the same duration as procedures would be applied to students without disabilities, provided that all required educational and related services continue. The student's IEP team determines the interim alternative educational setting for such services. Another fact question, kind of related to the last one, how do you determine if a behavior is a manifestation of the child's disability? Within 10 school days of any decision to change the placement of a student with a disability, because of a violation of the code of student conduct, the school district, the parent, and relevant members of the IEP team shall review all relevant information in a student's file to determine, number one, if the conduct in question was caused by or had a direct and substantial relationship to the student's disability, or two, if the conduct in question was the direct result of the school district's failure to implement the student's IEP. If the school district parent and relevant members of the IEP team determine that either of those conditions was met, the conduct must be determined to be a manifestation of the student's disability. If the LEA, local education agency, you and relevant members of your child's IEP team determine the conduct in question was a direct result of the LEA, Local Education Agency's failure to implement the IEP, the LEA shall take immediate steps to re remedy those deficiencies. The determination that behavior was manifestation of the child's disability. So, if it's determined the conduct was a manifestation of the student's disability, the IEP team should, has to, number one, 
conduct a functional behavior assessment unless the local education agency had conducted a functional behavior assessment, an FBA, before the behavior that resulted in the change of placement occurred, an implementation of behavioral intervention plan, a BIP for the students, or two, if a BIP, a behavior intervention plan, already has been developed, review the BIP and modify it as necessary to address the behavior. The school district must return the student to the placement from which he or she was removed. Unless the parent or the LEA agree to a change of placement as part of the modification of the behavior intervention plan. However, there's special circumstances that are an exception to this. School personnel can remove a student to an interim alternative educational setting for not more than 45 school days without regard to whether be the behavior is determined to be a manifestation of the student's disability if one, the student carries or possesses a weapon at school, on school premises, or at a school function under the jurisdiction of the Louisiana Department of Education or the local education agency. Two, knowingly possesses or uses illegal drugs or sells or solicits the sale of a controlled substance while at school, on school premises, at a school function under the jurisdiction of the Louisiana Department of Edu Education or school district. Or the number three has inflicted serious bodily injury upon another person while at school, on the school premises, or at a school function under the jurisdiction of the Louisiana Department of Education. So another question, what is a change of placement due to disciplinary removal? A removal of a student with a disability from his or her current educational placement is a change of placement if one, the removal is more for more than 10 consecutive school days, or two, the student has been subjected to a series of removals that constitute a pattern because maybe the series of removals total more than 10 consecutive school days in a year, or the student's behavior is substantially, substantially, sub be similar to behavior in previous incidents that resulted in the series of removals. And if additional factors, such as the length of the re each removal, the total time of the student has been removed and the proximity of removals of one to another, whether a pattern of removals constitutes a change of placement is determined on a case-by-case -case basis by the school district and if challenge is subject to review through due process and judicial proceedings. So at this point, it's a lot of information um, and a lot of information pretty fast. I'm gonna check the chat box, Any questions, okay. If you have questions, you can still put them in the chat box or save them to the Q&A at the end. Let's go on a little bit. Another fact question. What happens if I disagree with the disciplinary decision? If, oops, I need to put an answer. If you disagree with any decision regarding placement or the manifestation determination, you may appeal the decision by requesting a due process hearing. Bulletin 1706 allows for an expedited due process hearing. However, if your child's engaged in a behavior that leads to a change in placement to an interim alternative education setting and you request a due process hearing, the student must 
remain in the interim alternate education setting pending the decision of the hearing officer or until the expiration of the time period of the disciplinary change in placement, unless the parent and LEA agree otherwise. Of course, if the behavior is determined related to the child's disability, then no disciplinary action taken can be taken as a result of that behavior. Let's try a poll. These are those little poll questions. An expedited due process hearing shall occur within blank school days. Your first choice is 10, your second choice is 15, your third choice is 20. So I'm gonna give everybody a few seconds to answer. An expedited due process hearing. I think we can go ahead and end the poll. and share the results of this one. So half of us said 10 school days. One of us, 25% said 15 school days and 25% said 20 school days. So let's go see. The correct answer is C again. Whenever a hearing is requested to determine an interim alternative education setting, the parent or school district involved in the dispute shall have an opportunity for an impartial due process hearing consistent with Bulletin 1706, Subchapter B, Section 532. The Louisiana Department of Education shall arrange for the expedited due process hearing, which shall occur within 20 school days of the date the request for due process hearing is filed. I think if you chose 10, maybe you were thinking about the numbers of days that a child can be suspended before they have to get some type of services. For the expedited due process hearing, it's 20 school days. Cool, let's go take a look at where you can find the information on discipline. Again, this is a screenshot of the Louisiana Department of Education homepage. You can get there by going to louisianabelieves.com. You see where my blue arrow is again? You're gonna see on that home page where it says students with disabilities. If you click on that, this is gonna, it's gonna bring you to this, the landing page for students with disabilities. If you click where I have the blue arrow on that page, it's gonna be a bring you a list of special education guidance documents for families. One of the documents in here is listed, the, in here as a resource is the Louisiana Educational Rights of Children with Disabilities. You'll also notice this document comes in English, Arabic, Chinese mainland, Chinese Taiwan, French, Spanish, Urdu, and Vietnamese. So, the guide was developed by the Louisiana Department of Education to help parents navigate the complex system that oversees special education in Louisiana's public schools. Each school year, the school districts are required to give you a copy of the procedural safeguards. That handbook is notice of the procedural safeguards. Those safeguards are to inform us of the support services and protections offered by the local public school district. A copy of the procedural safeguards should be given to you once a year and 
upon initial referral or at your request for an evaluation. And when a decision is made to take disciplinary action that results in a change of policy making. And the first time you file a state complaint in the school year. And the first time you request due process hearing in the school year. And when you ask for a copy. The procedures when disciplining children with disabilities begins on page 20 of the document. If you'd like to read the discipline regulations, you can also go to Bulletin 1706. The discipline regulations start on page 46 of subchapter B in Bulletin 1706. Back to our questions. What is FAPE? FAPE is an acronym for Free Appropriate Public Education. When Public Law 94-142 was enacted way back in 1975, it required states submit plans that assured all students with disabilities the right to a free appropriate public education. IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, defines FAPE as special education and related services that are provided at public expense, under public supervision and direction, and without charge, and meets the state standards, and includes preschool, elementary school, or secondary school education in the state, and are provided in conformity with the individualized education program. <clears throat> Today, IDEA requires all states demonstrate that they have in effect a policy that ensures all students with disabilities the right to a free appropriate, appropriate education. A free appropriate public education must be available to all children residing in the state between the ages of three and 21, including children with disabilities who have been expended, suspended or expelled from school. Notice it says, including children with disabilities who have been suspended or expelled from school. Another fact question, does free mean the school cannot charge me for anything? I get that question all the time. The free in FAPE means school services must be provided at public expense under public supervision and direction without charge. Uniformly assessed fees are permissible. So a fee for a service may be charged only if it's a fee for all the students in the school. The term at no cost doesn't preclude incidental fees that are normally charged to students without disability and their parents as part of the regular education program. So those fees that everybody pays in the beginning as long as everybody is supposed to pay them, then students with disabilities are supposed to pay them. What does appropriate mean? <clears throat> so our analogy of if both will get you where you're going, then the Chevy is the most appropriate because it costs less and the results are the same. Appropriate doesn't mean best unless best is all available, oh, that's available. Before 2017, the standard for special education progress was some benefit, some educational benefit. In 2017, the United States Supreme Court made a landmark ruling, that's an important ruling, which changed the long-standing some educational benefit standard to a ambitious in light of his circumstances, 
That's a direct quote. Appropriately ambitious in a lot of his circumstances. The court wants every child to have a chance to meet challenging objectives. To meet its substantive obligation under IDEA, a school district must offer an IEP reasonably calculated to enable a child to make progress appropriate in light of the child's circumstances. That court ruling is called the Andrew F. Standard. Some of the ways the school can make sure goals are appropriate include to conduct to conduct complete, thorough, meaningful assessments that include observations in multiple settings, as well as thoughtful analysis of students' needs. Assessment should drive the, and does, drive the IEP. The school systems can develop IEP goals that are appropriately ambitious based on the student's unique circumstances. So the same IEP goals should never be written over and over. Then progress reporting is required. If the student isn't making progress, the IEP team can reconvene and address the lack of progress, perhaps by changing the goals or services. The local education agency should document a thoughtful and well-established plan in the IEP, which shows consideration of unique circumstances and be appropriately ambitious in the development of the FAPE Free Appropriate Public Education Offer. IDEA does not have a specific definition of the meaning of appropriate. The lack of a specific definition of appropriate education in IDEA has led to lots of disagreement between parents and schools about what constitutes an appropriate education for a particular student. It's what led to several landmark legal cases, the most recent being the Andrew F. case being heard in the United States Supreme Court. In that Andrew F. decision, the court clarified that for all students, including those performing at grade level and those unable to perform at grade level, the school must offer an IEP that's reasonably calculated to enable a child to make progress in light of the child's circumstances. It's pretty powerful. Another fact question, how do I know if my child is benefiting from his or her educational program? Probably the clearest evidence that the educational program is not providing the educational benefit is the child is not progressing educationally or even actually regressing in the present educational placement. Under IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, an appropriate education enables the child to make progress in the general curriculum as well as advance towards IEP goals. Monitoring IEP goals should be the first indicator if your child is making progress or not. At all review IEP meetings, the first thing you should discuss is the progress made towards the current goals. Section 14C5 of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act specifically states, and this is a quote, almost 30 years of research and experience has demonstrated that the education of children with disabilities can be more effective by strengthening the role and responsibility of parents and ensuring that families of such children have meaningful opportunities to participate in the education of their child and at school and at home." End quote. So some of the examples of how you can participate is 
to review your the homework your child is completing. Can they do it on their own? Do they need some extra support? Does it match up with the IEP goals and what you think your child should be doing or what other kids your child's age and grade are doing? You can also review grades regularly. Many schools offer online portals for parents to see up-to-date grades. Ask how the classwork lines up with state standards. You can go to the state standards on the Louisiana Department of Education website and see them for a subject and a grade um, level. You can review the progress reports the school sends home with the report cards. That's going to tell you, give you good information. You can request more frequent progress reports um, that mid in Calcasieu Parish, it's nine weeks, mid nine, uh, mid nine weeks progress report. Um, you can also do regular check-ins with your child's teachers. Don't wait for a parent teacher conference day. You can participate in your child's IEP meetings by asking clarifying questions so you understand. You can share information with, about your child that might be useful to the teachers. Um, an excellent way to do that is to share the All About Me for Younger Students or the My, my Portfolio with, for Older Students. You can find those two um, template documents on the Family Helping Families of Greater New Orleans website under resources. Next question, can my child participate in extracurricular activities and after school programs? Yes, extracurricular activities enhance your child's life as a member of the school community. The idea is specific that children with disabilities can participate in extracurricular activities and other non-academic -acad activities. The IEP even has a specific section for extracurricular activities. IDEA doesn't specifically address after-school programs like aftercare for younger children. However, all students with an IEP are also protected under Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act and Section 504 protects people with disabilities from being discriminated against. Section 504 requires programs to provide students with disabilities, quote, equal opportunity, end quote, to participate in activities and programs. The regulation implementing Section 504 at 35 CFR Section 104.4A states that no qualified individual with a disability shall on the basis of disability be excluded from participation in or be denied the benefits of or otherwise be subjected to discrimination in any program or activity which receives financial assistance from the Department of Education. In the United States Department of Education New York Office for Civil Rights responded to a complainant's allegations that her daughter with autism was discriminated by her school's before and after care program. The parent alleged the program is available to non-disabled students for $5 a day. The program required her to pay an additional $35.76 per day to cover the cost of the one-on-one -on -one aid required since she had a one-on-one aid during the school district. The school district alleged the program was not operated by the district and it would be undue financial hardship to provide a one-on-one -on -one aid since the program operated on self-generated income. The Office of Civil Rights response was, even if the school district doesn't operate the program, they can't deny a qualified individual from participating. 
In this situation, qualifying only required you to be a student at the school. OCR also said the daily cost to the school district to hire a one-on-one -on -one aid was not an undue financial hardship on a district with a $72 million budget. OCR determined the student was denied equal opportunity to participate in the program. If you want to read about the whole thing, you can go to a website that we're going to give you um, at the end. Um, it's www.ed.gov backslash about backslash offices list offices OCR. Yeah, it gets complicated. If you need it, let us know. I have my contact information at the end of this. Um, you can ask me or Wallace. Either one of us will get you this information. Another question, can the school force my child to do virtual school during COVID? If we believe all the professionals in a school want our children to make progress, then we have to believe they're making legitimate rec recommendations. However, not everyone buys into the theory and thinks their school operates with the mindset of convenience. So there's not a quick, easy way to answer this without considering several things. If the governor closes schools, then yes, your school can force your child and every other child on their campus to a distance learning options, which means they'll incorporate a synchronous and synchronous instruction virtually. The Louisiana Department of Education has created school reopening guidance, but ultimately gives most of the authority to the local school districts to create their policies using the recommendations from the Louisiana Department of Health and the CDC. So depending on your school's policies and numerous factors that played into those policies will depend on if the school can force your child into a virtual option. If the schools have reopened and had a positive case of COVID diagnosed, then that's going to play into the scenario. And depending on how close in proximity your child was to the diagnosed child will greatly depend on if they're required to stay home for some time or not. So let's talk about what the schools cannot do. The school can't just arbitrarily make a policy that says all students with disabilities must or must not blank. And you can fill in the blank. If the school provides virtual options for all regular education students, they need to provide the virtual option for students with disabilities. The bottom line is the child should be receiving an education in the place where they're most likely to make the most progress towards their IEP goals. But some students due to disabilities are at a high risk if they attend school on campus and parents need to factor that into making their decisions. Another question, can the school amend my child's IEP without me during COVID-19? So let's see the answer. IEP teams, including the parents, are still the key decision makers to ensure students have access to FAPE in the least restric restrictive environment. Parents and school system IEP team members need to work together if the IEP needs to be amended. The school system has to notify the parent or guardian a call and email to discuss of the modification and obtain agreement. If the parent or guardian agrees to the modification without convening the IEP team, document the modification through an IEP amendment or an individualized log. This document should be retained by the school system as part of a student's IEP and included in the IEP folder. If the parent doesn't agree to the modification or request an IEP team meeting, an IEP team meeting would need to be held. As noted above, 
IEP meet, team meetings can be conducted virtually or by phone. Another poll. Let's see if we can launch this sucker. So evaluations and reevaluations can be delayed due to COVID-19. Your first choice is yes. The Louisiana Department of Education is providing school districts with 30 additional days to complete an evaluation or reevaluation. Your second choice is no. School systems must continue to meet standard timelines. The third choice is school districts are given waivers from meeting all evaluation and re-evaluation timelines. So I'm going to give you a few seconds to make your choice. Give it a few more seconds. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and end the poll unless somebody says they need more time. So, 25% of us said yes, the Louisiana Department of Education is providing school districts with 30 additional days to complete an evaluation or reeval. 25% of us said no, the school systems must continue to meet standard timelines. And 50% of us said school districts are given waivers from meeting all evaluation and reevaluation timelines. So let's stop sharing this and see what the answers are, or the answer is. The correct answer for this one was B. In the Louisiana Department of Education Strong Start 2020, timelines and documentation for students with disabilities, the school system must continue to meet standard timelines and prioritize conducting initial evaluations and re-evaluations in the event there are intermittent, intermittent or limited opportunities for in-person contact with students during the school year. School systems must also have a plan in place to complete outstanding evaluations that were due during the 2019-2020 school year extended school facility closures. Re-evaluations are due by the triennial, the three-year due date. This may require school systems to implement procedures for completing any outstanding re-evaluation requirements that were due during the 2019-2020 extended school facility closure. School systems should plan for methods of remote record reviews and sharing of progress monitoring data and using available in-person time to collect any necessary additional components. Bessie did provide waivers for the spring of 2020 during school facility closures, but all initial evaluations opened up after the end of the 2019-2020 school year must meet all of the timelines. Thanks for y'all. Thank y'all for doing the poll, by the way. Let's go back and take a look about where you can find the information on Strong Start 2020. Again, we're at the Louisiana Department of Education homepage 
LouisianaBelieves.com. You see my orange arrow? Or gold, I don't know what color that is. But anyway, it's pointing to Strong Start 2020. If you click there, you'll be on the landing page for Louisiana Strong Start. There's all kinds of information on there. So when you go look, take your time, check what's available. Guidance specific to special education is under the heading Pre-K to 12 Strong Start Resources. So you see the blue arrow? All special education guidance is located in the section that says students with diverse needs. Two of the documents I find most useful to parents are first the family toolbox and section the Strong Start 2020 times in documentation. I just find all kinds of stuff in there. So I think that one was the family toolbox and that one is the Timelines and documentation. Oh, cool. We're getting very, very close to the end. Um, before we go to the final part, I want to go back over the checking questions to see how useful the training was to you. I'm going to launch a new poll with the same eight questions asked in the check in at the beginning. Um, number one, true or false? IEP meetings are limited to 60 minutes at a time. If more time is needed, the meeting can be reconvened. You have to scroll down to see all the answers. Two, or all the questions. <laughs> Two, true or false, parents do not have to attend IEP meetings. Three, true or false, I have to pick up my child every time the school calls and tells me to pick him or up. Four, true or false, students with an IEP cannot be suspended. Keep scrolling down, you guys. Five, true or false, school districts cannot charge any fees for a child with an IEP. Six, true or false, a school district must offer an IEP that is reasonably calculated to make, enable a child to make progress. Keep scrolling. Seven, true or false, the school does not need parental permission to make minor amendments to the IEP. And then finally, true or false, the Louisiana IEP guide is referred to as Louisiana Bulletin 1706. And I want to give everybody a few more minutes to do the poll. I know this is a lot of reading and answering at one time. Just a few more seconds unless you chat me up and tell me you need more time. Okay, we're going to go ahead and end the poll. Or check in. Check out. Either way. And... Let's, let's wrap it up. I know you're wondering about the answers to the questions. So let's go over them really quickly. 
IEP meetings are limited to 60 minutes at a time. That's false. We went over that 60 minute, a minimum of 60 minutes is a good practice. It might take longer than that. Some of them will. Um, parents do not have to attend IEP meetings. That's true. They can get your, the school system can get your input other ways. Three, I have to pick up my child every time the school calls me and tells me to pick him or her up. That's false. You have to pick them up if they're suspended, but if they're not suspended, ask questions. Students with an IEP cannot be suspended. That's false. Let's go to the next page. School districts cannot charge any fees for a child with an IEP. That's false. They have to provide the special education programming Free, but if other kids are paying fees, yours has to pay a fee. The, a school district must offer an IEP that is reasonably calculated to enable the child to make progress. That's true. The school does not need parental permission to make minor amendments to the IEP. That's false. They can call you about it, and then it's up to you to say yes, and they're supposed to keep documentation, or no, and they're supposed to have an IEP meeting. Let's see. The Louisiana IEP Guide is referred to Louisiana Bulletin 1706. That's false. Refer to your acronyms. When you get this PowerPoint, refer to your acronyms slide at the beginning. It's going to tell you what each one of the bulletins that we talked about today um, do or their purpose. So here's a list of resources we've mentioned today in the training. We're going to provide links to those resources and the information you receive after you do your evaluation. If you need more support on your parental rights or other education issue, you should contact us at 1-800-894-6558 toll free. Or if you're in Lake Charles, call us locally at 1-337-436-2570. Um, you're welcome to email us at info at fhfswla.org. We've got lots of good information on our social media channels like Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Please follow us, like us, share our posts, retweet us, whatever it is that you do on whichever one. Our website's a great source of information. You can be added to our newsletter list and find other great resources at www.fhfswla.org. So let me check real quick. Wallace is posting the link to the evaluation. So check the chat box for the link. Um, please do the evaluation on the training um you're going to get when you we shut this down when you shut this down it's you should see an evaluation on your screen right, right away and wallace is going to email you um, a link to it that information we get from the evaluation helps us improve all of our training everyone that registered and complete the survey will get a copy of the PowerPoint and a certificate of attendance. Let's see. Let me check the chat box if I have any questions and uh, anything. Yeah, uh, this went a little bit long. I apologize. Some of these go, just go a little bit longer. Um, but. If you're still here, chat me up if you have any questions. Um, we've gone through all the 
fact questions for this one. Hopefully you've learned something new. Um, you can email us if you have questions, by the way. Um, I, I will answer, one of us will answer. Let me check one more time and see if we have any um, questions in the chat box. And I don't see any, Wallace. Let me know if you see something that I forgot or that I missed. I really want to thank y'all for participating in the training and hanging on till the end. Don't forget to check our website and our Facebook page for all of our upcoming trainings and events. Um, you, like I said, as soon as you leave the meeting, you're going to get the um, webinar evaluation. I'm going to hang out here for a few minutes in case there's any questions that you want to come back with. You can use the link in your chat box. But thank y'all.